All right. Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about how to use these amazing water brushes. Lots of people get them for nature journaling, for urban sketching, for sketching in nature and other types of art because they're so convenient and easy to use in the field, but there's often a learning curve in getting used to them. So today we're going to talk about at least nine different field, tips on how to use them and uh, getting used to them. So practice today, them a little bit. So let's get the camera set up here and we will get started. So if you have water brushes of your own, that's great. If not, you can always just bookmark this video for later. And when you do get your own, um, you can come back and get some tips on how to use them. So the first thing we're going to talk about is choice of brush, because there are quite a few different types. And um, I have been using these um, Pintel brand ones um, almost exclusively for the last at least uh, maybe the last time I had an, one of the other kinds was about eight years ago. So uh, I'm not going to actually talk about any of the other brands in this particular video. I should probably go back and try some of them um, again. Uh, originally, I had bad luck with like the Kuretake brand and a couple of the other brands. There's starting to be a lot more different ones on the market. So uh, I will try some of those in the future. But Pintel comes in a, a bunch of different varieties and they used to be called Aquash. Uh, and I think now they have some other name that is a little bit uh, less intuitive and more confusing. So first we're gonna start off talking a little bit more about um, choice of these. So the ones, uh, the one that I use is the large and I pretty much use the large uh, exclusively. This is also the one that uh, John Muir Laws uses You've probably seen him recommend it. And I believe he uses just size large for almost everything. And whether it's in the field or in the studio, uh, this is the, the, the size large right here. This is what he uses. Let me get my uh, measuring tape out and see exactly the size of it, just to give you an idea. It is about, it's almost two centimeters long on the bristle. So that's size large and I think it's great this is the, is the main one I use. I'll talk about some of the reasons why this one can be a problem in a second. So this is the one that I get here. Oh, it looks like Mindy's here. Hi, Mindy. And um, just to give you an idea, this, oh, that's actually a different one. Let me talk about that in a second. This right here is a medium size and it's about um, just a little bit over one centimeter long of bristles. The water reservoir is the same size. Everything else is the same, and it actually looks exactly the same on the outside, which can be confusing. That is the, I think that's the medium, and let's see. Um, I might not have the very small one here. I don't have an example of the very small one. So there is one more size that is smaller than this. This is the medium, and I think the link that I put there is to the uh, is to a set that contains the small, the medium, the large, and it contains one that has like a smaller reservoir that's like supposed to be for fitting in your pocket, even though these can fit in your pocket already, um, from my experience. Okay, so then there's one other type that I'm going to show you, and this one here is um, a flat brush, and it used to be like in John Muir's Law's book. Um, he talks about using a flat water brush, but at that time when he made the book, uh, there was only, only the Kuratake brand had a type of water brush that was um, a broad tip like this. So now uh, Pintel has one as well. I haven't even used it yet, as you can see, and I will experiment with it, but um, just to show you a couple things about it, it seems like it's almost the same size a little bit shorter than the large and it has that wide tip, but it also has a different shape reservoir, which um, it feels a little bit weird in the hand. It's completely round, whereas these ones are sort of flattened. And one of the reasons for pins and pencils and other tools not being completely round is it prevents them from rolling. So since this one is completely round, it can roll off of a table. Uh, if you're in the field, that's usually not that much of an issue because you're not putting things down on a flat surface, but it is an interesting design choice. It also means it, it looks like it might be able to hold a little bit more water. I don't know what the, the reason is behind that. So there, there's a couple things about 
um, choosing a brush. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the biggest issue that people have with these, and that is water control. So let me just show you what I mean by that. I will take one of my newer ones here. Um, actually, let's let's fill it up first. So I'll talk about filling and cleaning, and then I'll talk about water control. So here is basically a brand new one. You can see the bristles are basically um, completely white. It's, it's it, it comes to a very nice point, uh, which is important for watercolor brushes, as you might know, with traditional brushes to test how it comes to a point. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to fill this, and I'll show you one technique for, for filling that I like. Um, filling them can be a little bit confusing. And one of the best things to do is to have something like a syringe like this uh, that you can use for filling. And there's also these little plastic pipettes. I tried to buy some on Amazon, but um, for whatever reason, they weren't shipping those uh, little plastic pipettes to the zip code where I was at. So I couldn't get them. Um, but there are these really small pipettes that you could fit in your nature journal kit. You could fit one of these as well. Um, and then that way you could at least take water from your water bottle and put it into your water brush when you're in the field. Because um, sometimes, depending on what your source of water is, it can be challenging to get it to go into here. A lot of faucets will work well, but like pouring from a water bottle, it might not actually go into that tiny hole. Um, one trick is if you're pouring from a water bottle, you can squeeze this. Um, and then as you're pouring with the water bottle, open it, and that creates a small amount of suction, and that can help. You can also use your lips and put water in your mouth and then push it into the reservoir uh, using your lips. And I would only use that in an emergency situation. Um, I'll mention in a little bit what happens when you get the bacteria from your saliva inside of this reservoir. But it, it is another way to do it if you, if you need to. Um, but right now I'm going to use this uh, little syringe thing here. So all you need to do is um, draw up water into the syringe. And there's like a little line here that suggests that there's like a maximum level for filling. Um, I have not found that to to really mean anything, um, but there is a line there. So in case you're wondering what that line is, I assume it's for, um, uh, uh, yep, these are good, good point. These are vet veterinary, uh, that's a veterinary little syringe. Sometimes the, when you get like a cough medicine, you can get something like that as well. So anyways, this has been, this one has been filled up and this is a brand new one. So that shows you how to fill them. Um, while I'm talking about filling, I also wanted to talk about cleaning. So um, one thing you can do is occasionally use white vinegar and put some white vinegar in here and run it through the bristles. So squeeze it and get the vinegar to come through the bristles and you can clean it that way. Some people say they put uh, a small amount of vinegar, white vinegar into the water all the time when they paint to prevent bacterial buildup. Um, I would be a little bit concerned about having vinegar in my watercolor all the time. Oh, Nature Sketches is here. Hi. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about water control, which is one of the main issues that people have with these. And I see people writing about this a lot um, online and on Facebook and everything like that. And let me just check my audio connection here. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's starting to rain here a little bit, so if it gets, um, hopefully it won't get too noisy. I'm broadcasting from the highlands of Santa Cruz Island in the Galapagos. All right, so um, hopefully you'll be able to see this a little bit, but um, as I squeeze, and this is a brand new brush, you can see the water is actually coming out at the very top. It's not even traveling through the bristles. And you might not have, have seen that, but let me point to where the water. So if you notice the water is coming out like up here, um, don't be alarmed. That is actually going to be um, okay, but it's good to be aware of because sometimes if you're painting, for example, and you squeeze the brush, the water is actually going to come out of this sort of black area right here. And that's um, 
that's normal. But one thing that happens is, especially when these brushes are new, um, they often produce so much water that it can be a little bit hard to control your washes. So let me give you an example really quickly here. So say I had to just paint like a small area of yellow. So I go in here, maybe I squeeze just to get the water flowing. But then next thing I know, it's actually a bit of water and it turns into a, a pretty heavy wash. Um, and you can see that the brush there is still quite wet as well. And look at how um, watery that is. So this is fine if you're doing bigger washes or moving more boldly. But if you're doing like very small landscape veto, that's gonna that much water is going to be a problem. And especially for people who are a little bit timid or new with watercolor and they want to have more control, this is gonna freak freak them out and it might scare some people away from watercolor in the first place. It looks like I'm having some issues with my internet connection. I'm gonna try to quickly uh, connecting to the other Wi-Fi so that I go out for a second. Okay, back. So hopefully this, this will um, hold up through the um, small rainstorm that we are having. And I can probably move my computer a little bit closer because that's a microphone I'm using. Okay, so one thing um, for the water control that I'm going to recommend is um, if you're having issues with that, one thing you could do is lean into the challenge and just practice doing this type of watercolor where you're doing sort of um, bigger, bolder movements and um, just getting used to that. One thing that happens is as these brushes get older, the flow will start to get less. So right here I have one exact same type of water brush, exact same size. And even though this is the exact same size, the flow is much less than the last one. You can see that the bristles are stained as well. So it's apparent that this is an older one because those bristles are stained and it just doesn't put out water um, at the same speed because the little membrane in here is um, just more clogged up. You can even see that there's some type of like bacterial film inside of the reservoir that has grown in there. Um, and that slows that slows it down. So I'll show you what it looks like if I do the exact same thing um, with that color yellow here with this brush instead. It looks pretty wet, but I have a lot more control over it, and it's not as sopping wet as the last one. So one thing you can do is when you buy your new water brush is you can just kind of lean into that challenge like I mentioned before and then with time it will start to flow more slowly. Another thing you can do is just always have two water brushes and at least two water brushes and that's what I recommend is I try now to always have and I think I've been doing this for um, at least three years intentionally. I try to always have two water brushes at the same time and you see here I put this little red ring on just so that it's really easy to tell when these are sitting in my nature journal kit and all I can see is the top that this is the one that has slower flow I use this for details um, anything that doesn't require as much water and then I use the new one for bigger washes like when I do the sky on a uh, landscape veto so that is uh, that is one way you can manage this uh, manage to to deal with the water control issue another would be to get a smaller size and you could use a smaller size but from what i've noticed even with the smaller brush the water flow is pretty similar um, and when they're new even these these smaller sizes it can be a little bit challenging or frustrating um, about the water flow so there's no one single solution to this water control issue, but I just wanted to share a couple options and really um, dive into it with you here today. In case this is something that you're dealing with, you'll know um, you'll know you're not alone, and you'll know um, what some of your options are. Um, also, one other thing I guess I'll mention is that um, if you do want to speed up this process um, that happens with older ones to, to slow the flow down. One thing you could do is you could fill it with water from your mouth. And I think that just by getting that saliva 
into here, the, the bacteria from your saliva will speed up this process and you'll sooner have a brush with slower flow. Another thing you could do is you could try getting water from a river um, or a stream or something like that. I have filled from uh, water from, from rivers before, such as the, the Colorado River when I was doing that rafting trip through the Grand Canyon. Uh, some streams and some bodies of water might cause the that whole process to happen even faster than what you want. So um, be careful with that one. Oh, yay. I'm so glad to hear that. That's I'm glad that that system is working for you. So, sorry if I'm cutting in and out here. The internet is a little bit unstable, maybe because of the storm. Okay, so let's go on to the next thing. I'm going to check these off. So we, we talked about choice of brush. We talked about filling and cleaning, including filling and cleaning the field. We talked about water control. Now I'm going to talk about switching tops. So um, as you can, as I mentioned before, these all have the same type of reservoir, except for that weird um, flat one. So they all have the type of the same type of reservoir. And the main difference is going to be, you know, like if you have the new one, like I mentioned, or an older one, or if you have the different sizes. One thing you can also do in the field is uh, another benefit for carrying multiples of these is you could have one that is just basically a backup reservoir. And instead of having to fill from your water bottle or instead of having to carry that syringe, all you need to do is hold the two. And this is good if you, you know, sometimes in the field, uh, you might not have a place to sit down or anything. You could just hold these two like this and you could take the empty one um, and put the top that you want onto the one that still has water in it and switch the tops like that. Um, this can be really useful if you have one of the tops that you want to continue using in your painting, like maybe it's the old one that has a, a water flow a rate that you prefer. You could just unscrew that one and put it onto the new the reservoir of the new one that's still full of water. And just in a few seconds, you could um, get water into it. Whereas, you know, taking out your water bottle, unscrewing the top, and then trying to pour water into here or use a syringe is going to actually be um, a lot slower. So that is one way that you can switch tops in the field and um, benefit from, from that flexibility. So I just want to know you to know about that option. All right, so next, um, we're just going to show, I'm going to just show you how to do a continuous wash um, with a water brush and a couple of the things that make it different uh, from a regular uh, watercolor brush. <clears throat> I just want to say thanks right now to all my Patreon members, and I'll, I'll put up my uh, Patreon website right now. It's the main way that people support the show, and they also get access to um, special um, content behind the scenes. Right now I'm publishing many podcasts um, from the Galapagos. So go ahead and check it out. You can actually listen to the beginning of those podcasts, even if you're not a paying patron. But um, paying patrons start at $5 a month, which is, is um, less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks. So definitely consider it. So right now we're going to do a continuous wash. <clears throat> I'm going to get one of the ones that is uh, flows more quickly. It's the regular large Pentel brush. <clears throat> so the first thing that I'm going to do, and the water brushes are definitely way better at this than traditional brushes. It's really easy to get a wash ready because you can just squeeze out water. So depending on what kind of palette you have, um, you might be able to just hold a towel or a rag um, underneath, like here in your fingers. That's what I do. Um, this is an essential thing to have with you when you're using water brushes. Um, I often use paper towels, but um, some people use old socks that they put on their wrist. My wrist isn't accessible very easily to me, um, but that is a, a possibility. If you want to wear an old sock on your wrist, um, go for it. That's what John Your Laws and a bunch of people do. Okay, so right now I'm going to use a little bit of this Windsor Violet. Love that color. It's one of the, the, the only colors in this palette that's from Windsor & Newton instead of Daniel Smith, I believe. Um, so I got my, uh, now that I got the Windsor Violet in there, what I'm going to do, oh, that's interesting. Look, it looks like a bristle just came off. Or no, it's, a, it's part of a seed. That's what happens when you nature journal in the field all the time. Okay, so now that I got, this is pure Windsor Violet, I'm gonna clean my brush now. So I'm gonna mix, mix a, a new color. 
I'm going to get it pretty clean before I put it into another well. And uh, that's what you should always do, right? <laughs> Don't put a dirty brush into um, the well. Now I'm going to actually get a little bit of this naphthamide maroon. It's a closely related color, so it's not like that exotic of a cross. And I'm going to mix that into here. It looks like it's kind of overwhelming the Windsor Violet a little bit. But now that I have that, what I'm going to do is if this is in, um, it doesn't have enough water in this wash for me, I can just squeeze the brush. So I'm squeezing the brush um, with my fingers and letting uh, more water come through. And you can see the water is coming out sort of up there near the top, actually. It's not coming right out of the bristles. And so I'm mixing that in. And one thing that's important to know is um, when you squeeze it like that, it has an immediate effect and immediate feedback. So you'll see water droplets actually coming out, but there's also delayed a little bit of a delayed effect. So water will continue to be coming out of the brush for a little bit afterwards. And you don't get as clear of feedback about that part. So that might be confusing to you. If it is, you can always go back to your rag and dry the brush off and you can train yourself to notice what that the tip of that brush looks like um, depending on how much water it has in it and this is the same with traditional brushes as well is you you develop a sense of understanding how much water is inside of your bristles and how much pigment is inside of there so then once you get this um, where you want it this wash is as, as diluted or as wet as you want it you and you get your um, brush uh, loaded with that then you just come down here and we're going to try to do a um, continuous wash. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start up here and I'm just going to create, try to create a solid block of color going back and forth. If I want to keep going, what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to come back here and load it back up again and carefully try to bring that, um, that through. Practicing getting really perfect continuous washes with watercolor is going to, to it, it might not feel like as fun and creative and like a Bob Ross sort of way, but this is actually the kind of thing you need to do to um, get better and actually have control over the medium. It's like doing any kind of basic exercises. <clears throat> so practicing this is um, a very good idea. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do a graded wash. And this is way easier to do, in my opinion, with a water brush than a regular brush because it will naturally, as you go, you can squeeze lightly and let out more water. You can see there's more water coming out. And you can get um, a graded wash in that way. I'll continue it here. Oops. There was a little bit of uh, extra pigment stuck on the brush there. So that is much easier than with a uh, regular brush, a, wet, a traditional brush. So that is how to do a continuous wash and a graded wash. Now we'll give a little bit more about, we'll talk a little bit more about mixing colors. <clears throat> All right, so one thing you can also do, say for example, you like working with traditional brushes better. Uh, the internet keeps cutting out. So perhaps you like working with traditional brushes better, or for example, maybe you're doing a really large wash. It is possible to do almost like a full paper, like the, this, is, this paper is nine inches by uh, nine by 12 inches, it's possible to basically do with this large size water brush, do an almost, you know, purely continuous wash on this whole brush, uh, on this whole page, which is pretty impressive. Um, you would not be able to do that with an equivalently sized traditional brush. I think it would be much harder. However, if you're in a situation where say, for example, you have a really large um, traditional brush and you want to create like a, a, a large wash on uh, a large page, for example, one thing you could do is you can actually use your water brush just for mixing and preparing colors because it's quite good for that and it's still convenient since it has water in it. 
even if you only use traditional brushes for painting, I think that having a couple of water brushes could be really useful just for mixing your colors. So, for example, as soon as the internet comes back, um, I'm going to take some of this buff titanium here. And because I can squeeze water out, I can soften it and, and have a lot of control over how much water I use in my um, in my little uh, in my little pan here, my pan of watercolor. And then I can add, have a lot of control when I create this wash here of how much water I add to it. This is also would be the case. This is this is a rather opaque um, watercolor, so it's it's quite like gouache. So that if you are uh, working with gouache, these could be very useful um, in the very at the very least for uh, mixing your colors. I got a little bit of the dirt from the, the mixing area mixed in. Sometimes um, that can be nice, or sometimes that can be frustrating trying to get a really pure color. Now I'm just going to clean, and in this way, I could, for example, just be using this brush help me uh, mix my colors while using another brush for painting. I'm going to take now a little bit of quinacridone sienna and mix that in. So I'm coming in here with my almost clean brush and I'm going to take it back here and add it into the mix. So you could potentially just be using this water brush um, also because they're they're quite quite a bit easier to clean than a traditional brush you could potentially just use this as a sort of palette brush, just as a brush for um, preparing your paints in your watercolor palette. Um, and then you could go on to use a, a different brush, a different size of water brush, or a traditional brush um, for the actual painting. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna use this traditional brush. It feels so weird. I can't believe I actually brought one with me on this trip. And there you go. That is how you could mix colors with your water brush. And I think they're superior to traditional brushes in that way. Now, for example, I cannot completely clean this brush without having to dip this into a source of water. So that's a huge downside um, of traditional brushes right there. I'll have to remember that it's dirty and, and clean it later. OK, so let's cross off uh, number six. And I started to mention this before, but using two brushes, um, one thing you could do is you could have uh, uh, two brushes and paint with them at the same time. So for example, maybe, oh yeah, Sandra's here. Hi, Sandra. Maybe one thing you could do, and maybe you all are pretty creative, so you might've thought of this already. Oh, it's really raining out there now. Hopefully the audio won't be too bad on, on this video. Um, one way that you could um, work with two brushes at the same time is um, you could have one dedicated to lighter colors and the other one dedicated to darker colors or um, warm and cool colors. That way you wouldn't have to, and, and some people do this, I think, with acrylic and oil paint. I mean, I think with oil painting, it's the main way people will work is they'll have certain brushes that are just for certain colors while they're in the middle of the painting. Um, you could even put the lid back on it without completely cleaning it. Um, hold this to the side or put it back in your um, in your bag and then start using the other one for like the cooler colors. And just in case that's not just in case for the, the visual learners of you, I will actually show you what that looks like. Um, so this one right here, um, let's say this is for my cool colors. So um, let's mix up a little bit of a like purple blue here and say we're going to do like a um, purple thing here. It's also very dark. And you'll notice that this one is, real, is, is the really wet one. Oh, I forgot to tell you, there's one um, trick that can work sometimes for this is if, you, if your um, newer water brush is, is too wet, it doesn't work as well it's not as easy to control as on a traditional brush, but what you can do is you can hold a paper towel or a rag just to this unpigmented edge, like near the top of your water brush and try to suck out some water that way. So maybe there's like a little bit of this dark color here too. 
this is, isn't going to be the greatest example because I'm not um, going to let it dry. But say this is my one that's sort of ded dedicated to darker, um, cooler colors. So I'd put that back in my um, watercolor kit or just back on the table with the lid on it. I didn't really clean it all the way. And now I'm going to take my one that I'm using for my warmer color, especially if you're using things, if you're trying to use um, very different colors next to each other, especially like yellow that you really don't want you know, you have to clean the brush really well before you put it in yellow. But if you're using two brushes at the same time, you could easily come over here and get some yellow. And, and maybe you do want to want to wet on wet. And this is this having two brushes um, with each one dedicated to a different color would be how I would go about uh, preparing for a wet on wet is I would get both of my colors all mixed and ready to go. And then I would have those two different brushes um, ready to go and dedicated as well. So I don't have to clean. I don't have to clean one brush um, super, super well before sticking it into the yellow. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, hopefully that makes th sense um, how you can use uh, two brushes at the same time um, and have them sort of dedicated to different colors or different um, colored families. Oh, James is here too. Thunder and rain. It seems like it's almost always thunder and rain uh, in Pennsylvania. All right, so uh, I'm gonna just clean these. It's a good, good habit to just always put them away clean. And it's also a good habit to always test it on white paper um, or white, uh, a white cloth before you start using it. Never assume it's clean. Always clean them before you put them away but always assume that they're dirty when you take them out and get ready to use them. Okay, so let's cross off number seven using two brushes. Okay, the next thing is number eight, filling with ink. I don't have any ink with me right now, but one thing that can be fun um, is to take ink or make your own ink and put it inside of the reservoir. Uh, there are there are brushes that are basically like that, uh, ink brushes, and they they almost have this exact same style, but they're often a different cartridge um, that have ink, and they will have basically the same type of bristles. Um, Pentel makes them as well, and um, you've probably seen them. I I don't carry them when I travel internationally because I've had issues with them um, spraying ink out on the plane um, or in high altitude places or when I get to. Uh, my destination. But um, I feel like these uh, water brushes actually work better as ink brushes if you just take this whole body and fill the uh, reservoir with the ink of your choice. You could even mix watercolor. Like if you knew you're going to be using a lot of a cer certain color, like maybe, maybe not for nature journaling, but like for a certain type of project, you could mix a large area of that color um and then uh suck it up with a syringe and inject it into one of these actually let's just do that for um for fun right now okay so what we're gonna do is let's see um, here this one hardly has anything in it um i'm just going to squeeze out a little bit of water from this one into here and then i'm going to mix let's see i'm just gonna do purple because i I like purple and use use it a lot. Uh, this is also really fun for lettering. So I'm gonna take some of this naphthamine maroon, which is one of my favorite colors. It's not too saturated. And I'm also just gonna take advantage of all this dirt in the, the corners. Uh, dirt is in random colors in the corners. And this helps you get more sophisticated colors because it'll be it'll muddy it slightly and it won't be too saturated. If you just use saturated, colors all the time it's it's kind of boring so knowing how to to tone them down and make them less saturated is a, a very important thing to know how to do and now i just need to make enough where i can actually suck it up with a syringe this isn't a very deep palette so i need to be careful that it doesn't just spill um, all over the place but i'm squeezing a, a last little bit of water out of here and i think i probably have almost enough to do this all right, so now I'm just going to put the, um, the lid on. It's still dirty. I'm going to take the top off. 
Yes, James, the large turtles are now, uh, you, you're probably referring to my recent uh, uh, Instagram posts of uh, in the Galapagos where I, I bicycled past a uh, Galapagos tortoise. It, it's the Santa Cruz um, species. I can't remember the, the name right now, but um, that particular species is reproducing in the wild. And that was a that one was wild, even though it's uh, walking on the road in town. But they do have a breeding program. And in some of the cases, uh, the, the breeding program was required to, to jumpstart some of the populations on some of the islands. And um, as most people know, some species, some of the Galapagos tort tortoise species have gone completely extinct. And there's some where I think they're only in, 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 the, in the breeding um, facilities. So uh, good question. Also, distilled water would be a good idea. Um, and here I use that here in Galapagos, I, I haven't been using distilled water. I've actually been using the tap water, which isn't even um, isn't safe to drink, unfortunately. Um, that's something that I, I, I talked about in a, or one of my recent uh, mini podcasts um, on my Patreon channel. So if you want to know more about uh, the drinking water in Galapagos, you can check that out. But distilled water would be an option. Probably not necessary. Reverse osmosis um, might be good, but also not necessary. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to suck up this watercolor right here. Hopefully it will work. Easy, beautiful. So it's not very much. And then I'm going to squirt that into here. All right, it's in there. So let me show you what I like. I used to have one like this that had purple ink in it, and I would use it for lettering. So, and also I think one important thing um, to remember, I had a, um, uh, an art teacher one time who said that ink and, and watercolor are basically the same thing. And so um, I think it's important to sometimes understand like what the names actually mean and how things are related and stuff. And I think it is sometimes useful to, to think about ink and watercolor as basically being the same thing. So now let me show you um, how to use this for lettering. Hopefully it works. So uh, I'm going to say is, uh, so one thing you might be noticing is there's a little bit of a resist on my paper. That's probably from um, sweat or, 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 or oils from my hand on the paper. It happens more in the tropics. Um, or if you're in the field. And that's why it's coming, it's not coming out like that perfect. I probably like rubbed my forearm on here. So we probably could have made it a little bit um, stronger. And obviously, if you used ink, uh, it would be probably more concentrated. But I just want to show you that that took um, probably less than one minute. And you could do that yourself. Like, say you're, you're in your nature journal doing like a really big map. Um, and you're doing like a really big map and you need to do a large area that's all blue or you just want to have something to do this isn't the best example of lettering but the lettering with um, water brushes can come out really good uh, this is not the best example of of lettering you can also use them for um, really nice borders so this one's almost out of ink i think or maybe not um, but like you can do borders like this and if you just had a water brush that's all, all, already loaded with ink. Uh, gray ink, for example, could be a cool one to have. This page is really um, resistant, um, must have a lot of oils. But like, look at how nice of a, uh, a border you could make. 
I don't want to use a different paper because it's uh, that one's so resistant. Let's see over here. There's a lot of oil on this page too. But you can see that having ink or pre-mixed watercolor in one of these could actually be a, like a really useful tool. So think about that as an option. It was very easy. You could probably even do that in the field. Okay, and then last but not least is to talk about the main differences with traditional brushes. Um, one of the main differences is just the difficulty in cleaning. So as you can see, um, all not AI, okay. Um, one of the main uh, uh, one of the main differences is just the difficulty with cleaning. So, like to actually clean one of these, or even to just use one of these in the field, you need a small container with water. And I have seen there's some nifty little containers that people use for plain air watercolor painting, but there's no there's nothing there's no container that's nifty enough that makes it um, as convenient as actually having the water in a reservoir on on the on on, on the actual brush so um, that's that's the first thing and that's kind of the deal breaker for me in terms of using uh, traditional brushes in the field and sometimes I bring them with me but I found that um, I almost never use them like I've been here in Galapagos for a month and I haven't used this brush a, a single time all right so then the next um, difference that I'll talk about is the diversity of, of shapes and sizes. Obviously, you can get way more types of uh, traditional brushes than you can um, these. You can even get um, traditional brushes that cost $600. Um, so if you like uh, conspicuous consumption, then traditional brushes are, are definitely going to be a better option because I think the most expensive one of these is probably um, less than five dollars maybe there's some that cost five dollars um and then also like if you want like some weird shapes um these are definitely sexier traditional brushes are, are are probably the one of the sexiest art supplies there are they're one of the ones that could be locked up in a case um in a little box with like velvet lining at the art store so if that's something that's important to you um then definitely go with traditional brushes um but there are bigger sizes. So like if you need a really big brush um, or a really small brush, traditional brushes will also be better for you. Another main thing uh, that I'm going to point out right now is dry brushing. So as I finish cleaning this off, it's still a little bit dry. You'll notice that it starts forming this, um, this sort of pattern. And uh, that means that I can create uh, dry brush um, textures, which is often hard to do with the water brushes because the water brushes are basically never dry. So what I can do is I can go in here and load my brush without using any water. I can intentionally create that um, sort of distressed, frayed um, edge. Uh, the camera's having trouble zooming in on it, focusing on it, but you can see that there's a frayed edge there. And now I can create texture with that. And that is something any type of dry brush technique um, is something that's going to be a lot harder to do with a water brush than a traditional brush. So that's another difference. Um, now I have to annoyingly clean it, um, unlike a, a water brush. Um, let's see, what are some of the some of the other differences? Are there are traditional brushes that are made with natural animal hair? Um, so if you want to use an art supply that's made from the belly button fur of a rare Siberian sable or other um, strange uh, mustelid family animal, then traditional brushes are definitely um, better for you. I think there's some that are made out of like eyelash hairs from caged cats in China or something like that. So there's a lot more options there with um, traditional brushes, even though the synthetic ones seem to be getting a lot better. Um, I can't think of that many more uh, major differences with them right now. I think I uh, listed as many as I could think of. If you have, if you can think of any more, um, post them in the comments. Obviously, like there's things you can't do with traditional brushes, like put ink inside of them. Yes, you can paint with ink, but you couldn't fill the whole thing with ink. 
um, which means you have to keep dipping it into the ink and potentially knock over uh, a bottle of ink on your table, which is something that I've, I've definitely done um, as a pain in the butt. Um, one inch goat hair brush. Wow. Yeah. So like I said, um, the traditional brushes are definitely going to be better for that. Oh, another thing that I should have said while, while I was on that is here you can see a splatter technique. Those types of techniques are also going to be easier um, with the traditional brush, but you could use a toothbrush. A toothbrush actually works um, even better um, for that. The water brushes aren't great for um, uh, splatter techniques, but as you can see right now, I am able to get some of a, a splatter technique splatter going on here um but it's it's interestingly uh very regular i haven't experimented with using water brushes too much for a splatter technique but as you can see it's possible but maybe it's not as good as um a traditional traditional brush so those are some of the differences and some of the ways that you can use water brushes better i'm going to share um this link that has a combination of different water brushes um, from Pintel that you can try here. Um, you could copy and paste it or um, yeah, try copying and pasting that. And then I just want to thank one more time my um, Patreon members for supporting the show. Um, Sandra, who's here right now, for example, is um, one of my Patreon members. And let's see here. Let me switch cameras. Um, more content coming soon. Check out my shorts. Uh, check out my Patreon to listen to some of those podcasts. Even if you're not a supporting member, you can listen to the first minute for free. There's some really fun new ones coming. Um, I'm working on my next Skillshare class, which is really exciting. And uh, lots of other news um, that you can find out about that all more um, on my Patreon. I don't know what next week's episode is going to be yet, but um, stay tuned. And I'll see you Wednesday night at 6 p.m. California time. Bye.